Amen. Well, what's up, Wake? I feel like we always have to start our messages like that, right? What is up, Wake? So yes, my name is Jackie, and I have been on the Wake staff for over nine years now, which is crazy. You, um, as Sean said, you've probably seen me up here on stage a couple of times, and probably oftentimes back there in the tech booth, tech team, best team. (laughs) And this is because I am in charge of production at Wake. And I've definitely worn a lot of different hats in my time here. And I wanna tell you about one of my favorite ones. The most favorite part about my job, what I get to do, is I get to pour into, disciple, and mentor our student worship leaders. So the worship leaders that you see up here that are students, I, have, I get to pour into them, I get to help raise them up, and it is one of the things that has brought me the most joy in my life. And I've been doing this since 2017. And believe it or not, you actually know my first intern ever, her name is Annie. So I taught Annie some uh, vocal and piano lessons just for a little while, and then she came to intern for me through our student intern program her senior year of high school, and now Annie is in our leadership development program here at Stone Creek underneath our worship pastor, John. And not only that, but Annie is now one of my very best friends. So why in the world am I talking to you about Annie right now? Well, that's because I want to invite her out here to join me for this message. Will you please give Annie a round of applause? Yeah, yeah, keep it coming, keep it coming. (laughs) And for those of you who are like, I don't know who Annie is, you do now. Um, (laughs) So Annie was my first intern ever. Um, I'm so excited to get to do this message with her. Um, It is something that is really, really special and close to my heart. So tonight we're going to get, as Sean was talking about within the lyrics, we're breaking down some songs that we do at Wake and talking about the reason why and maybe a deeper meaning into the lyrics of the song and where we find them in scripture. And so tonight we're going to be doing a song that's called Everything That Has Breath by Jesus Culture. So if you're here last week, you remember that Carson and Alex uh, broke down good plans with the doxology. So it's gonna be like kind of a similar feel to that today. So I would love for us to take a look at the first part of the first verse, if you would lead us. All right, so there's actually a lot here. So I'm going to break it down um, into two lines at a time. The first is, we lift our hands to the heavens. We are here for you. How many of you guys raise your hands during worship? With a show of hands, you know? Yeah, okay, so if you raise your hands, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up, if you know why. Okay, most everybody kept their hands up, that's great. So there's several reasons why we raise our hands in worship. And some of those reasons come from some Hebrew words. So Hebrew is one of the original languages of the Bible. Um, so some, some Hebrew words, there are seven that mean praise. So every time we read our word, one word, praise, specifically in the Psalms, it could be one of seven different translations for that word. So there are two out of the seven that talk about the raising of hands. So the first one is yada. You guys repeat that, yada. Yada. Right, so yada is to revere or worship with extended hands, to hold out the hands. In Psalm 67, three, it says, may the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you, or yada, you. May all the nations, yada, you. The second one we're gonna look at is toda. You guys say, (laughs) toda. Very good. So now you guys are all Hebrew scholars, by the way. You're doing a great job. So toda means an extension of the hand. Thanksgiving, specifically thanksgiving for things not yet received. 
Psalm 56, 11 through 12 says, in God, I put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can a man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. Or render toda to you. And so other translations often will uh, interpret this as uh, offer a sacrifice of thanks because this is difficult to thank someone for something that you have not gotten yet. That is a sacrifice of praise. It is praise of faith for God to come through. And so the next two lines are, we reach for the hem of your garment. We know what it can do. And this brings us to a story that's found both in Mark 5 and in Luke 8. And we're going to look at Mark's version of the story. For context, Jesus was already on his way to help someone else. So someone had come up to him and said, my daughter is sick, will you please come? So Jesus is traveling on foot and he's on his way to go help this man and his daughter and the crowds are starting to surround him. And that is where we are going to pick up in the story. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once, uh, he realized at once that the healing power had gone from him. So he turned around to the crowd and asked, who touched me? Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How could you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Just one touch of his garment healed her. In this moment, Jesus was busy, okay? He's on his way to go help somebody else. All these people are crowding around him and Jesus stopped. A lot of times I wonder if we think that God is just too busy for us. He's too busy helping someone else And I mean, he's already getting praise all the time, right? So why does he need my praise? Why would he want my praise? But God wants to be with us. The entire story of Israel, God's people, is all about God wanting to be with them. And then we get the best example of this of all is Jesus Jesus becomes the face of God, God in the flesh. What better way for God to show that he wants to be with us than to live among us as a human? God wants your praise. He wants your time, your relationship. God will stop for you. And what if we had this woman's kind of faith? Her faith in what could happen is what made her well. When we sing, we know what it can do, do we? Do we believe it? I think we would be amazed if we actually did believe that just one touch of heaven from heaven could actually change our situation. So we're gonna look at the second half of this verse.
So we refuse to go through the motions. This is a declaration that is saying that I am not here just to look like I know what I'm doing. I'm not just singing another song. I'm not raising my hands with empty meaning. That is our declaration. We are not here to go through the motions. Jesus spoke to the religious leaders of his day and said, outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's harsh. We don't want to just look like we worship Jesus on the outside. We want our hearts to be engaged. We want our hearts to be worshiping him. We are inviting Jesus into the room and into our hearts. In Matthew 18, Jesus says that where two or more are gathered, that he is in our midst. He is present when we worship. And it also reiterates what I talked about earlier, right? God wants to be with us, with you, right here, right now, in this room, in your room, in your car, wherever you worship, Jesus is there. Jesus will dwell there. And hear the sound of our devotion. Do you know that God hears us? In Psalm 116, verse two, the psalmist writes, because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. I love the idea of God bending down his ear to listen so closely. Let it build a throne for you. God inhabits the praise of his people as Psalm 22 verse three describes. And when you inhabit something, it means you live there, you dwell there, and God inhabits a throne. A lot of the prophets have seen this, have told people about this, that God is on a throne. And that throne is made of praise. God's throne is built on our praise. God's throne is built on our praise. And that's gonna bring us to the chorus of the song. Everything that has breath Let everything that has breath praise the Lord is a literal line from Psalm 150, verse six. Psalm 150 is the last Psalm, the final one in that book. And it's probably the most famous one um, about giving God praise. So we're gonna read the whole thing. It says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heaven, praise him for his mighty works, praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud, clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes breathes, sing praise to the Lord. Praise the Lord. So our book of praises, the Psalms, ends on this last line. Everything that has breath, praise him. So I lived in New Hampshire for a couple of years after high school, and one day I was praying in the park and I was listening to some music, and uh, this park is really close to the water, and so it has some docks that you can go out on and you can look out onto the bay. And as I was looking out, listening to this worship song, there was a post that was sticking out of the water, and there was a black bird on it. And there was nothing particularly special about this bird. It wasn't like really majestic or, you know, there was nothing really special about it except one thing, is that it just had its wings held out like this. It wasn't trying to fly, it wasn't trying to do anything, it was just holding its wings out. And as much as I knew, and as much as I know that creation worships God, it was in that moment I heard so clearly God speak and say, all creation worships me. And that moment was so impactful that I actually have a tattoo of that bird on my ankle. Because when we praise, we are joining all of creation and all of heaven, everything that has breath. 
praise the Lord. And then the next phrase that I want to focus on is sing a new song to the Lord. And there's another Hebrew word. Remember, I mentioned those in the beginning. So there's another Hebrew word. It's tehillah. Now, I know I got your attention if you uh, tuned out because uh, I'll, I'll say it again. Tehillah, okay, we're in church. I'm not talking about, all right? So tehillah means a hymn, a song of praise, a new song, a spontaneous song. And now I've known that singing a new song is throughout the Bible, but guys, I was really not ready for how many times. Scripture talks about singing a new song in Psalm 33, Psalm 39, Psalm 40, Psalm 95, Psalm 96, Psalm 98, Psalm 144, and Psalm 149. And that is just the Psalms. Singing a new song is also found in Exodus 15, Isaiah 42, Luke 1, and Revelation 5, just to name a few. So I know some of you are already, already ready to tune me out again because you're like, oh, I'm not a singer, I'm not a musician. Like, what would I need to know about singing a new song to the Lord? And I'm going to ask you to really bring it in here. Everyone who tune, every, right here, right here, right here. Everyone has a new song to sing. Everyone has a new song to sing and here's why. Singing praise has much more to do with your heart posture than it does the quality of your voice. I'm gonna say that again. Singing praise has much more to do with your heart posture than the quality of your voice. So how do we do that? Sometimes a new song simply looks like what is currently going on in your heart for prayer. And maybe it's how you need God to come through. Maybe it's a specific song of thanksgiving and Sometimes it's just a, start, a starting point is singing what is actually on your heart even when another song is playing. Maybe the words aren't resonating with you and you need to sing a new song, your heart song to God. What is your heart saying? You can sing it to him. Another way would be just O's. Sometimes that's all we have, O's, O's. But it would be your song, your song between you and God. So let's take a look at verse two. come to pour out oil to wash our Savior's feet. This song talks about a beautiful story that takes place in Luke 7. Let's read it. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume or oil. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them with her hair. And she just kept kissing his feet and putting a perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts and said, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go on, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with a rare perfume. 
I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. This woman gave everything to Jesus. Her whole life's savings were in those jars of perfume. It's even noted that a lot of people, people who were there took note that she wasted that on Jesus. This woman is who we need to remember when we sing, we refuse to bring an offering that doesn't cost us anything because you are worth everything. This is the kind of worship that Jesus is worthy of. So let's think of this alabaster jar as a metaphor, okay? What is in your jar? What is the most precious thing to you in this world? What do you value most? It can be an actual object or person or idea. Think about it. Is it your influence? Is it your relationships? Is it your time? Time is really valuable. Or is it your trophies or awards? Your straight A's? The worth of that jar is nothing compared to what Jesus deserves. It's not even comparable to the glory of who he is. So in Exodus 33, there's a story where Moses makes a big and almost ridiculous request of God. Moses wants to experience the glory of God and to see God's face. So God tells Moses that he would literally die if he saw his face. And he still grants Moses to see him, to see his back as he walks away. And so because Moses experienced that, just seeing God's back, that small glimpse of the glory of God, Moses' face began to light up and shine. And it shone so brightly that people could not even look at him. It hurt too much, like looking directly into the sun. So Moses had to wear a veil over his face. So why do I bring up this crazy story? I'll tell you. In 2 Corinthians 3, it says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. This is in reference to what Moses had experienced, this veiled face. And a glory that was once so unapproachable that people would die if they looked upon it is now available to us. That is crazy. The cost of our comfort, our popularity, our status, our pride, our self-preservation, our feelings, it is a cost that is so worth the experience of God's glory. So now I wanna take a look at the first part of the bridge. So this bridge is actually full of those Hebrew words. I'm pretty sure like four out of seven are described just in these three stanzas that we're gonna look at. So the first one is kneeling in reverence. And this is directly tied to the word Barack, not Barack Obama, okay? Everyone, you say, repeat after me, Barack. Good job. It means to kneel, to bless God as an act of adoration, to praise, to thank we don't really know exactly what it's like to have a king that rules us, but we really do love the idea of it. We have a whole bunch of shows and movies that kind of give us a glimpse maybe about what it's like to have a king or be royalty. We love to follow the royal family and the royal weddings. And we are kind of have this obsession over these kingdoms and kingship. And what do people do 
when they come before the king. They kneel. Not only do they kneel, but they often look up. And what I love about what it means to truly barak, it means to kneel with your eyes set on the king. Dancing with joy. This is the Hebrew word halal. You guys say halal? Good job, you guys are doing great. So halal means to boast, to rave, to shine, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. Now listen, I'm not talking about the way that you guys act a fool around here, okay? I see you after service. I see you pushing your friends around, trying to take their money and their snacks. And, you know, I see you guys getting up in the middle of service and going to the bathroom, like Sean kind of mentioned earlier, okay? This is not the kind of acting a fool that I'm talking about. When we look, so the main psalmist, David, was a king, and kings held the highest respect and regard, and for good reason. When you think about how a king acts, like, what the... How would you describe that? How would you describe how a king acts? Anybody? No? Like, yeah, kind of poised, right? Distinguished with grandeur, right? Okay, so that's how a king usually acts. And in 2 Samuel 6, it says that David danced before the Lord. And he, everyone that was looking at him thought that he was out of his mind, like so foolish. So much so that his own wife got so mad at him. She rebuked him, told him that he was a fool and that he brought shame on him. Yet David responds like this. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. So there's a time to look foolish in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of our friends, in the eyes of others, if it means bringing glory to God. We'll sing songs never ending. I've heard a lot of people described, describe like heaven as a never ending worship service. And there's usually one of two response, responses to that. The first one is extreme excitement. And the other one is complete dread. It's like, you are so pumped to be able to like worship forever and ever in all eternity. And then there are people who are just like, oh, I can't even stand to do that here. Like I'm gonna have to do that forever. Sounds like a drag, right? And when I think about these songs never ending, I don't think that that's just in heaven. And so I think that there are songs going on in heaven. How much we participate in those, I don't know. I've never been there. So um, those songs that are never ending can start right now. In Psalm 34, it says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly sing his praises. So the songs are not just for heaven. They're for here and now. Let's take a look at that second part of the bridge. Let's face down before you For a victory shout With our hands we shall So if it's face down before you, brings back to that first Hebrew word we talked about, yada. One of those definitions is to revere or respect. And what do you do before a king? We talked about it before, you bow. And all throughout scripture, when anyone was faced with the presence of God or an angel, they literally fell down to their face in respect to that. And so when we kneel, when we face down before you, it's how we respect, show our respect and praise to God. A victory shout. So this is the last Hebrew word that we'll be looking at today um, when it comes to this song. It's the word shabak. You guys know what to do? Good job. Beautiful. So this means to address in a loud tone, to shout, to commend glory and triumph. Psalm 145.4 says, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Or... Shabak, your works to one another. Shout them. And let's look at this final part of the bridge. You're the God of salvation. You're the great I am. You're the Alpha Omega. We love to bring you love. To 
All right, so I just wanna say really quick, a quick thank you to Annie. That is the last part that we'll be singing today. Everybody say, aw. <laughs> yeah, let's thank her one more time. Thank you so much, Annie. We love you. So, God of salvation. We see this all throughout scripture, specifically in Isaiah 12 too. It says, see, God has come to save me. I will trust him and not be afraid. The great I am is from Exodus 3.14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, that I am sent me to you. Then there's Alpha and Omega. Those are two Greek words. They're the first and the last Greek letters of the alphabet. So you can kind of assume that they mean the first and the last. And Jesus is called Alpha and Omega in Revelation, and it's in Revelation 1.8, and then again in Revelation 21.6, the first and the last chapter of the book. You see what they did there? First and last, and the first and last chapters? Yeah, 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 all right, we're getting there, we see it. And then the final line we'll discuss is, we love to bring you praise. A declaration after all of this remembrance remembering who God is, what he has done, we love to bring you praise. So there are a few different groups that I would like to address in the room tonight. The first group is the group where you are convinced that you have this worship thing down. You're just like, oh yeah, I know what to do, I got this, I raise my hands, I kneel, I do all the things, I love Jesus, it's so great. And you probably do, you probably have a glimpse. And I'll even admit that I don't have it all figured out, even though I'm up here teaching it. There's so much more to experience. I think that's what I love so much about that song, Deep Dive, is I don't want to end my life knowing there was more I could find, and yet there's always more to find. So tonight, for those of you who think you have all of this figured out, I think there was a posture in there that you haven't tried yet. I think there's a way to praise that you haven't given a chance. And maybe tonight's your night. Maybe you need to dance. Maybe you need to shout. Maybe you need to kneel. Maybe you need to understand why you're lifting your hands. Is it in thanksgiving? Is it in expectancy? What new way do you need to experience tonight? The second are the people who just don't participate. Maybe you truly don't understand. Maybe you had no idea what it meant. Maybe you don't like worship very much. Maybe you don't really like the songs that we sing. And honestly, guys, I would be lying to you if I said that I love every song that we do up here. There have been songs that I've even led that I don't like, but you would never know that until now. Don't tell anybody, okay? It's not about our preference worship and praise is not about our preference and what we like or don't like. Sometimes we have to command our soul to praise. Praise goes beyond our preference. It goes beyond our comfort. It goes beyond what our friend next to us thinks. So I'm asking you, if you don't participate in worship, what if you just gave it a shot? What's the worst that could happen? I can promise you it's not gonna be anything bad. What if I'm asking you to open your hands literally and figuratively? Give praise a try tonight. See what God can do with it. Then there are those of you who don't even know who Jesus is, so how could you even begin to worship him in the way that we're talking about? If you haven't decided to follow Jesus, I have some good news for you. Because if you don't truly know him, when you do, you realize he is actually worthy of all the things that I'm talking about tonight. Jesus is so worthy because there is a God who is good and who loves you. And the problem, the problem is sin. It separates us and divides us from God's presence. And the solution and our hope 
is Jesus who gave his life so that we could live with him forever. And so I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads tonight. This is a sign of focus. It's a sign of respect. Whatever group you find yourself in tonight. But specifically those who have not decided to follow Jesus yet. I wanna give you that chance. I never wanna leave this place without giving someone an opportunity to decide to follow and give their life to Jesus. So I'm gonna pray a prayer and I would love for you to pray in your heart these things. Jesus, I know I fall short of your glory. I know I have sinned and I don't want to be separated from you anymore. Jesus, would you forgive me? I want to turn toward you and away from the things that will destroy my life. Thank you, Jesus, for the life that you gave. I want to follow you. And I'm gonna ask you to be really bold tonight. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you. Praise God. So I'll pray for us one last time. Father, thank you for each student in this room. Thank you that you are here in our midst. And God, no matter what group people find themselves in tonight, I ask that you would meet them where they are. For the one who's gonna try a new posture of praise, for the one who's going to try a posture of praise for the first time, I ask that you would meet them, that they would experience your presence, God. May our hearts be open to what you have for us and may our praises be a holy roar that storms the gates of heaven. May you bend down your ear to hear us because we are here for you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.